Well, <laughs> well, good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed some of those Valentines, and I really hope you don't use any of them. <laughs> um, so, but it's Valentine's Day, so if that's your, shot, that's your thing, man, shoot your shot. Go to Alt 4, pretty romantic first date. Um, but in all reality, um, it's an honor to stand up here um, this morning and try to explain to you God's word and how it can change your life every single day. Um, before we get into the text this morning, have you ever heard of the law of diminishing returns? <laughs> the law of diminishing returns is this idea that the more something that we get, the less valuable it becomes. Okay, so for example, suppose you have zero dollars, okay, absolutely no money. All right, it shouldn't be too hard for most of us to picture, okay? And then somebody walks up to you and hands you a $100 bill, okay? So this $100 is, very, is now very, very valuable to you, okay? It's your first $100. You've suddenly become 100 times richer than you were just five minutes ago, okay? Now, imagine, though, that you have $100 million, okay? And someone does the same thing. They walk up to you, hand you a $100 bill, how much value or what kind of impact does this $100 have on you now? Okay, it's, a, it's the same $100, but it's lost most of, if not all of its impact or its value to you because you have already have so much money to begin with. But I'm burdened that many of us view God in a similar way. That we grow up in a Christian house with Christian parents and we're in church eight days a week and we pray before for dinner, but um, the gospel slowly becomes less and less exciting, less and less scandalous, and less and less incredible. I mean, praise God for Christian parents and, and for being raised in the church and hearing the gospel from a young age. I mean, I know that life very well, but we're here in chapel every day. And we're hearing the actual words of God. And I don't know about you, but it often doesn't move me or shake me up the way that I know that it should. I mean, am I, am I alone in this? Does anybody else feel this? That our sinful flesh gets so familiar with the gospel that we grow dull to its power. And, and Peter addresses this kind of thing in his second letter. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 3 to 15 together. Uh, Peter begins his letter with an opening sermon, and then in verse 12 of chapter 1, gives kind of a purpose statement for the entire book, why he's writing this letter. And so uh, once you get there, look at the purpose for the letter in verse 12. It says this in verse 12, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, because I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me, okay? And so we'll get to what he means by these qualities and some of that, but look what he's doing, okay? He says that you know all these things. He's not telling, he's writing to believers in this letter, so he's not telling them anything new, but Peter sees it necessary to remind them of a few things. The goal is not only just to remind them, but also to stir them up, to stir them up because he's about to die and he wants these believers to never become immune to the power of the gospel that is theirs and that should be increasing. Because we don't serve a God of diminishing returns and we can't act like we do. And so my goal this morning is Peter's goal to simply stir you up by way of reminder to live for and to cherish our God the way that he deserves and the way that he requires. And so my main point of the text, the main point of the text this morning is this, because of who you are in Christ, true believers must always grow. Because of who you are in Christ, true believers must always grow. Let's read the passage together, starting in verse 3, 2 Peter 1. It says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, 
having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so point number one this morning is this. We have been given all that we need. Look at verse three. It says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and excellence. Okay, this is crazy that, that we've been given everything we need to, for life and godliness. And these two things aren't separated here. And so he's saying that everything we need to live a godly life has been given to us. Not that we worked really hard to finally get there, to finally live a godly life. Not that we've gone to church and now I know what to do and what not to do to look like a good believer. No, we've been given everything we need to live a godly life, which in effect eliminates every excuse for us not to live one. We've been called to live a life pleasing to God and we've been equipped to do so and so now we have no excuse. And so then the question becomes, am I accessing what I've been given? Are you using the things that God has given you to live a godly life to actually live one? And what's the source of these things? I mean, his divine power. His divine power, look at it. His divine power has granted to us all these things. And this divine power is released to believers through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Okay, so knowing Jesus is how he gives what is needed for life and godliness. But this knowledge is not something we do, but he called us. Okay, verse three says that. He took initiative to call us. And isn't it interesting how, how God is always the one taking initiative? I mean, do you realize that God didn't have to create the world, but he took initiative to do so? And when Adam and Eve sinned, God is the one who approached them. And even in his curse, he, he initiated a promise and a plan for redemption for the people in the defeat of sin. When Moses was herding sheep in the, in the desert, he wasn't looking for a burning bush, but God initiated the saving of the Israelites from Egypt. And when we were running from God, when we were still sinners, God initiated our salvation by sending Jesus to be one of us and to die in our place and make a way for us to have life. We did nothing. We initiated nothing. And so he called us. He called us to his own glory and goodness, but also by his own glory and goodness to be equipped to live a life that is pleasing to him and that is satisfying to us. And so not only to his glory and goodness, but by his glory and goodness, look at verse four. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And so this verse says that God has granted to us precious and very great promises. Now, we don't really know the content of these promises. Some people say it's the Holy Spirit. Some people say it's the eternal kingdom. But the emphasis here is that we're now able to be partakers in this divine nature. And so through these promises, the believer gains two things. One, participation in the divine nature. Okay, Peter, again, is writing to believers here. And so because of these promises... We're washed clean and become united with God. And so these promises allow us to be more like God. We're promised to share in his moral excellence now as our sins have been forgiven. And we're promised to then share in his glory later. And so number one, we get to participate in this divine nature. But number two, we escape from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And so, yeah, we know that there's corruption all around us. We see it everywhere. But this verse gives a very clear reason why it's there. There's corruption because of sinful desire, because, but, but because of the glory and goodness of God, we have a way of escape to not only escape corruption, but then in turn to be partakers in this divine nature. And if we're believers, then this is done. Because of Jesus and his death on the cross, if we accept his free gift of salvation, we've received and continue to partake in this divine nature. As believers, we've been set free from sin and invited and equipped to live a life that is full and fully pleasing to God. And so Peter's calling them here to simply become and practice what you already are in God's sight. 
holy, righteous, redeemed, and set free. And so God has given us everything we need to live for him, to live in awe of him and in reverence of him by his initiating work and his incredible glory and goodness. And so what do we do with this? How, how do we live in response? And that's our second point this morning is our responsibility. And Peter answers this question of what we're supposed to do in the next few verses. Look at verse five with me. It says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Okay, and so these verses here, they're built off of what we've just seen. For this very reason, because you've been given everything you need for life and godliness, because you're partakers in this divine nature, then you must do something. You cannot now sit back and be content with an infantile and stagnant faith. There's a requirement here for our responsibility. And so what do we need to do? For this very, very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. To work hard at it. Give intense focus and determination to adding things to your faith. Now, it's not saying that to maintain our salvation, we have to do things. We've already saw that um, we've been united with Christ, and that was a gift, and he called us. So we don't do these things to maintain, maintain favor in God's sight, but rather there's a responsibility and a requirement here for us to grow. To work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Philippians 2 says, because it is, even though it's God who works in you. And so Peter is saying here that human effort in our spiritual growth is absolutely vital, even though it's not enough on its own. Okay, so our human efforts to be like Christ are inadequate, but they're still absolutely necessary. So make every effort to add to your faith. But when was the last time you made every effort? I mean, something you poured your heart and your soul into and you worked hard at day in and day out. Something that consumed your thoughts and your desires. I mean, my thoughts kind of go to like a sport or a sports movie where the team just runs off the field and, and they've left everything out there, right? What is the last thing you can point to and say, yeah, I gave that literally everything that I have? I mean, for me, that's, that's kind of hard to think of. But isn't our pursuit of holiness too important to give a half-hearted effort to? Shouldn't our desire to fulfill the command given by our heavenly father who sent his son to die in your place, the God who loved you so much that it killed him, the God who enacted divine justice on his very own son instead of on you, shouldn't the command from him to be holy as I am holy receive nothing short of us than our very best? So are you giving every effort to your faith? Do you value the gospel enough to give it every effort? What if spiritual growth became common? Are you making every effort to grow in your faith? But Peter doesn't just tell us to add to our faith. He tells us exactly what to do. He begins a list of things that should be evidences or marks of a Christian. And so, again, Peter's writing to believers, and he says in the passage that they know these things, and, and we know these things. And so we're not going to spend a ton of time getting in the weeds of all of that, but it's still important to look at. And so look at this list with me. He begins with faith in verse 5. And he has to, right? Like without saving faith in Jesus Christ, we can't grow to be more like him. And so faith is kind of the foundation that each of these other things is built on. And so he says, add to this foundation of faith virtue. And some translations say goodness or a practical reflecting of the character of Christ. And, and add to that knowledge, wisdom to determine the good from the bad. Next is self-control. Control your passions instead of being controlled by them. This is a submission to the control of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And after this steadfastness, the mature Christian does not give up. They continue to grow in, in their pursuit of the Lord in the face of difficulty. And this perseverance springs from the promises of God, the knowledge of Christ, and his divine power. After this godliness, this is a word that's, that's used, often connotates like religious or, or a reverence, an awareness of God in every aspect of life. 
And add to that brotherly affection. Godliness cannot exist without brotherly affection. First John talks about how those who love, love God must love their brother. And if they do not love their brother, then they do not love God. And after all these things, Peter finishes the list and kind of crowns the whole thing with love. The greatest virtue of the believer is to love. And, and we're to love because Christ first loved us. Not because of what we've done, not because we're lovely, but because of who he is. This is a sacrificial love, a love that's been demonstrated to us. And so God commands us to have the same love that he's given to us. And so what Peter's doing here, he's simply calling for maturity. He's calling believers to grow up in their faith and, and live the way that God requires. And so this list begins with faith and it ends with love. It begins with what is needed for salvation and ends with the result or the outcome of union with Christ. Because of what Jesus has done, we can have faith and, and live out that faith in, as a reflection of our God by his grace and for his glory. He has called us and enabled us to do this by his own glory and excellence. And so again, Peter's calling them to live and practice what they already are in God's sight by practicing these things. But then comes a terrifying and sobering and convicting warning. Look at verse eight. It says, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And so true knowledge of Christ produces these things. Just like an apple tree just produces apples, a believer now just produces these things. And if you possess these qualities, then you must allow them to increase and allow them to manifest in your life. But this, again, faces us with an intimidating question. Are these things increasing in your life? Could someone look at you and say, yeah, that person is marked by goodness and self-control and brotherly affection and love. Are these qualities increasing? If they are, then keep it up. That's great. This passage says if that's the case, then you'll, you'll keep from being ineffective and unfruitful. But do you also see the warning because it's also saying that if these things are not increasing, then you will be ineffective and unfruitful. I mean, the last thing any of us would want is to be, is to be labeled unfruitful or ineffective. But I'm convinced, I think that would be, that the devil would love nothing more. Right, right? It's almost like it's Satan's number one goal is to drag as many souls into hell as he can. But he looks at believers and understands that his first goal is gone. And so he must go to his second goal. And his second goal is to make every believer as ineffective and as unfruitful as possible. To have them walk a spiritually flat life marked with apathy and no real desire to know or love God. And Peter is saying here that we must be growing so this doesn't happen. And so if you possess these qualities and you do, if, you're, if you know Jesus, then you must allow them to grow. We're required here to grow because a lack of spiritual growth is a sign of spiritual death. And this is a scary thought. And, and I'm convinced we Cedarville students have to be even more vigilant to pursue these things every single day because here it's so easy to feel okay on the outside but have our spiritual lives rotting away on the inside. It's so easy to get caught along in doing the motions of, of normal spiritually soaked things here. And it can be so easy to take advantage of the very good, very rich opportunities we have, but we must learn how to feed ourselves. We can't rely on being spoon fed from the chapel stage every day if we really want to live a life for the Lord and be effective for his kingdom. And this, so this is such a danger. These qualities must be from the heart and they must be increasing. But the warning gets scarier as we keep going. Verse nine, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. I mean, these are very, this is very clear. If we lack these qualities, then we're blind. If these aren't things you're fighting for and making every effort to increase in, this passage is saying that we don't know that a spiritual war is going on. 
It's like we're blindfolded standing in the middle of a battlefield. And, and the word Peter uses here is pretty rare in the New Testament, but it means to blink or to shut the eyes. And so what he's really saying is that if you're not pursuing spiritual growth, it's because you've deliberately shut your eyes. You've chosen to look away from spiritual things. It's like you deliberately put on the blindfold and walked into the crossfire. And he goes even further to say that you've forgotten you've, or, or deliberately put out of your mind what Jesus has, that Jesus has changed you and cleansed you from your former sins. The one who makes no effort to grow in his faith is blind, is nearsighted, and has chosen to forget what Christ has done for him. I mean, how disrespectful, how shameful, and how appalling would this be if we really believed it? That when I become lazy in my pursuit of the Lord and no longer hotly pursue him to grow, it's not because I'm tired. It's not because I get busy, but it's because I've chosen to forget the sacrifice that God has made for me. It's like I look at his face dripping with blood and his pierced hands and, and I say, no, this, this doesn't concern me. This didn't happen. I don't need this. I don't remember this. I'm, I'm just gonna do my own thing. But if you're anything like me, I'm often here. I often make excuses. I often don't desire to grow. I'm often unwilling to put in the work that God requires of me. How often am I not steadfast? How often am I not loving? How often am I not self-controlled? I mean, how often do I mock the gospel through my apathy? But friends, this makes the gospel so much richer. That if you're in this place right now, maybe you wouldn't say that you're far from God, but your spiritual life just feels kind of flat. Maybe you're waking up every morning and you're getting in the word, but then you shut the book and go out throughout your day and by lunch you can't remember what you've read. If you're there this morning, then first of all, I want you to know that you're not alone. But second of all, look at the gospel. Look at what Christ has done, that, that God the just will and he has punished sin and sin will not go unpunished. And the punishment that you and I both deserve is death. But the Father in his love and his grace looked upon you and he looked upon me and he said, I want that guy. I want her. I do not, I will do anything to get them in my family. I will send my son, my beloved son to live a life that those criminals could not. And to live as one of them and, and to relate to them and teach them and then I will punish him on their behalf. I, the one that they sinned against, will take the punishment that they deserve on their behalf so that they can even have a hope of being saved. And, and when Jesus dies, he will conquer Satan's greatest weapon and prove to everyone that there is life in, his, in my name and that they can have it if they just come to me, if they just confess and believe in me. And, and he did this for you and he did this for me. People who know this, who've learned it, and they're so often not changed by it. Sinners who are redeemed, but so, still so weak that we cannot remember the power of the gospel and are so often not in awe of it anymore. He's done this all for you. And so if you don't feel like you're growing, keep seeking the Lord. Keep looking at him, look at him longer and longer. Remember that he is still showing you grace even as you wander and forget what he has done. May we make every effort to live the way our God calls us and to grow to be more like him. May we ask God to change our affections and transform our cold hearts to see the gospel for what it truly is. And then Peter then begins to wrap up this opening sermon with some directions. And so our final point this morning is his final encouragement. He says in verse 10, therefore, so because of all these things, because you're united with Christ in his divine nature, because you've escaped the corruption of sin, because we need to be working hard towards holiness and spiritual growth, because of all this, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these things, you will never fail, never fall. So because of all this, because of potential blindness and the need for godly living, he again emphasizes our need to work hard to live it out. 
Our faith is not a stagnant one. It's not fire insurance that we can just hang on to and say we believe, but not let it change us. If you're saying you're a believer, but your behavior is not reflecting that, then you need to think really hard about where your heart truly is. If we've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we will be changed. And if you're not changed, I don't know if you can confidently say that the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. So if we've been saved, our lives will simply reflect it. And so Peter is saying here, confirm your calling with a life that is agreeable to that calling. And Peter's saying here that if this is your aim, if you're locked in here and focused here, you will not fall. You'll experience steady growth, not perfection, but long-term growth in the same direction. And this type of living, because of what Jesus has done, affirms our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, the kingdom of God is what we're striving for. It's the destination of this long journey, not because you've worked really hard to climb your way there, but because of your calling and your election, you've been granted access to it. The entrance is provided, it says. It's not obtained, but God graciously gives it to us. So though the Christian life requires effort, requires perseverance and growth, the kingdom is not gained, but it's a gift of God's generosity. And until this gift is provided, we are obligated to continue the race and to continue the fight. Until Christ calls you home, it is your responsibility to be more like him and to point others to him. And this gives us hope that our striving is not in vain. Because of our efforts to grow, we get to be more like our Savior now here on earth, and we get to spend eternity with him in heaven. And so Peter's writing this passage to these people to stir them up by way of reminder. He's reminding them that of who they are in Christ and then what that means for them. We are, by God's grace, partakers in this divine nature, which gives us both the power and the motivation to grow in godliness. We have all we need, but we must live in light of that. If we do not, we'll be rendered ineffective and unfruitful. He's encouraging them to live the way that, they're, that they were created to live. And the same is for us. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember you're his and loved by him. And remember that he has required us to grow. We must put in effort. We're required to grow. And so my goal this morning was simply to stir you up by way of reminder to live for and cherish our God the way that he deserves and the way that he requires and I want to do that as, as we head out. And so what do we do with this? How do we apply it all? Well, I have a few very practical things we can do. Okay, number one, get in the word every day. How do you expect to grow in Christ's likeness or be effective for the kingdom of God if you're not using the very tools he's given to do so? And guys, you know this, but chapel's not an excuse. But can I let you in on a secret that you're not the only one who wakes up some mornings and doesn't want to read their Bible. You're not alone if getting in the word is not your first desire every single morning. But this does not mean that we don't read it. When this happens, we plead with God and we ask God to change our cold hearts and and change our desires. And we get in the word and you look at it until it changes you. This is effort. Number two, don't hide your struggles or lie about your spiritual flatness. I've talked to a lot of people leading up to this message and almost all of them have have agreed that recently their spiritual life has felt kind of flat. And if this is the case, why do we walk into conversations or one-on-ones with brothers and sisters in Christ and and act like our spiritual lives are thriving and we're learning so much if that's really not the case? I mean, be honest with one another. If God's doing amazing things, then celebrate that and talk about it. But if your walk with the Lord feels gray and stagnant, seek counsel, seek prayer, ask for help because the problem is never with God. So let's fight together for thriving spiritual lives and this can't happen if nobody knows where you're really at. So if this is you today, find somebody and be honest with them. Share your struggles and your burden of a flat spiritual life because the gospel brings life and it brings freedom. 
Number three, make every effort to grow. Take your personal walk with the Lord seriously. Get in the fight against your sinful desires and against the evil one. Do not lay down when temptation comes. Fight hard. Make every effort to grow to be the one, to be like the one who laid down his life for you. And number four, look at the gospel. Behold the glory of God. Do not shy away from the weight of your sin. Do not shy away from the holiness of God because it's precisely this divide that Jesus came to restore. Look at the gospel and keep looking. Remember who God is and how much he loves you despite yourself. Behold the wondrous mystery and the scandal of the gospel until it changes you and it convicts you and you fall in love with it. And when this happens, keep looking. Behold the glory of God and live like it's true. Soften your heart so that you may please the Lord with your whole life and be effective and fruitful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are good, Lord, and you are faithful. And God, we confess together, Lord, the times that we don't seek you, Lord, the times that our hearts are cold and that we give in to our own selfish desires and and we don't pursue you the way that we know we should. So God, I just pray that you would change our hearts, change our affections, Lord, to be pointed to you so that God, everything we do is glorifying to you, God, and, and has you at the forefront of our mind. Lord, we need you because God, this isn't natural, this isn't normal, but God, you've saved us and you've changed our hearts and Lord, this is what we desire. So God, I pray that you would Help us, Lord, to love you more and to make every effort to be more like you. God, we love you. Help us to love you more. And in your name we pray, amen.